Kitco Mining special coverage of PDAC is brought to you by Gold Mining and Uranium Energy Corps. All metals are becoming critical. That was the key message of a keynote presentation at 2023 PDAC. What does this mean for the mining sector and should we be afraid? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined here by the author of that keynote, Ken Hoffman of McKinsey & Co. Ken, welcome to Kitco. Thanks for having me. Now, Ken, there are, a lot, there are a host of messages in your presentation, lots of data points, several takeaways. What are some of the things that most resonate with you? Well, I think, you know, when you see uh, that we produced about one terawatt of batteries globally this year, and we need to get to 400 terawatts of, of power, it just shows the astronomical amount of increase we're going to need to really get us for, for a sustainable future. The, the challenge is we're going to need a lot of metal. Um, but on the other side, you're seeing a lot of solutions come out that will make this possible. You know, for example, when I see a car in China that gets a thousand kilometer range to be recharged in five, six minutes, that's really exciting stuff. Um, that shows you that we'll be able to have the product out there. The question is, can this mining industry provide all the metals needed to get, get us there? Well, one of the key themes at this year's PDAC has been critical metals and its impact on mine supply. And can the mining sector respond? And we've heard Robert Friedland speak about that. We've heard Rio Tinto speak about that. And there, there, there is a lot of doubt in the ability of the mining sector to respond to that and how it is going to respond to that. Um, I imagine that's a, a sort of fundamental part of, of your analysis of, you know, to get there, the, the dots don't yet join up. No, but we had a huge help when the U.S. came out with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which by some calculations at McKinsey could add a trillion dollars to the value chain over the long term. And you're really starting to see very deep pocketbooks with huge amounts of cash trying to make this value chain be built. And that's only good news for the mining industry. So I think as governments become really, really involved, much like China has been very involved in building their industry, as you see the US and Europe really get involved, it really changes things for the mining industry. So I think that's, that's all great news. And obviously this is a, a, a moment of change, not just for the mining sector, but uh, perhaps for humanity at large, but it does have or implies fundamental changes for the mining sector. In your presentation, you said the mining sector is already being fundamentally reshaped. It's more profitable than it was over the last two decades. Global revenue of materials has increased fivefold, I think you said, but you said there's also greater volatility in the sector. Um, does that make it more difficult for the miners to invest in these new projects and also for investors to invest in the miners? Well, there's another good thing going on where OEMs really want to see where their metal is going to come from. They see they need a huge increase in cell supply to make their EVs and their trucks and stationary storage. And they're very willing at this point to invest upstream. They don't want to be miners themselves, but they want to work with the miners. So in essence, that de-risks things. When you have major OEM, big EV company coming in and saying, hey, we'll fund a lot of what you need if you can guarantee us this material we'll tell you what batteries we're going to produce. And there's a real match. I think the, the big change is it's no longer the mining company throwing out metal and hope someone buys it at the marketplace. It's the OEM saying, we're working hand in hand with you and we're going to really take you every step of the way. So from that standpoint, it's a lot easier. And I think we counted close to 60 deals already between OEMs and mining companies and that's going to be the new future of this industry. Okay, because it's been part of the, uh, the, 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 the dialogue over the past 12 or so months that the mining companies need, need help with this. I think Robert Friedland mentioned this, mining companies cannot do it on their own. It needs to be governments, OEMs, or, or users, consumers of the metal that need to come in and help finance. Because we're in an environment where um, to compensate for depletion, the great depletion, great erosion, that kind of thing, projects are getting bigger. Um, which means more political, financial, social, reputational risk. Um, and that must make, put pressure, a lot of pressure on the mining CEOs and perhaps make them reluctant to green light these five to $10 billion um, investment decisions. No, but at the end of the day, they're necessary. And again, I think if you work with you know, a lot of these EV companies who are trying to be very green and they sort of can help you message why this project is necessary, why we need it, I think that goes a long way to tell the public, 
wait a second, there's a reason we're doing this. Um, if you do believe in more global warming, this has to be done. Um, and so I think that working along with all stakeholders, be it indigenous groups, be it government agencies, be it NGOs, to say, hey, we're doing this, we're doing it the best we can, and don't cut corners. Um, I think all those things can work out. It's, it's a challenge, huge. But can it be done? Yes, and I think it is being done. How do you think the sector and society at large can get past nimbyism? Because that seems to be a, a particularly difficult nut to crack. I think it is always going to be a difficult nut to crack. I think there's some, some new technologies, particularly say in lithium, where all you're doing is taking up you know, water from the ground, putting it right back in. The only thing missing or added or anything is a lithium spot. As these new technologies come before, I think it's going to be a lot easier to talk to the public and say, here's what we're doing, here's what we're not doing. So, so I think from that standpoint, embracing new technologies, investing in new technologies will really help you work with the stakeholders to tell them, like, hey, this is a better way to do things. We need this. It's not going to destroy the environment. Um, it's going to actually be relatively benign. And there we go. But let's not make any mistakes. Let's, let's, not, let's not hide anything. Let's be fully open with everyone what mining is and what it's not. It does seem that the, the governments need, local, regional, national, need to help companies there because the companies seem to be willing to do the right things and have the right technology and, and attitude to that, but helping to, to show that and convince local populations perhaps needs a bit of government um, grease, to, well, not grease is the wrong word, <laughs> the government to help participate in that conversation because there is a, you know, the public generally has a, does not trust the, the private sector. This is an age of, of mass information, of information. So the mining industry and governments and all parties who want this to happen, who really want to control climate change, really need to start with this messaging about everything we do, be transparent. If something goes wrong, let's say something went wrong. Let's be open and upfront, but let's make sure we're constantly ahead of the curve, not letting someone else drive that narrative for us. I think that's the important part is, and I think some people have said in a bunch of meetings, let's not be reactive, let's be proactive all the time. Okay, now funding development projects is, is, is one challenge, but um, the other sort of side of the message coming out is the lack of exploration, the lack of grassroots exploration, the lack of new deposit discoveries. Um, some people say there hasn't been a major copper discovery for at least 15 years, and copper is perhaps the most critical metal of all. Um, how much of a concern is this? I've been looking at this industry for 32 years. It's been the same thing I've been hearing for 32 years. Industry does seem to find ways to find projects. Um, they're never as big as what they were 20 years ago, um, but they can be better processed, they can be better refined, the yields can be better. I think um, as, you know, as we move forward, um, the industry has always found a way to find that metal. Um, and I have faith that they'll continue to do so, but it does take that investment in new technologies. It does take productivity measures. It, there's a lot of things that go into it because you're right, I don't have grades that I had in 1900. I don't have the grades I had in 1980. So how can, but I'm, I'm much better and more advanced technologically. So, so those are the things that I think continue to invest with. And if they are, uh, we'll find a way. Okay, you mentioned uh, direct lithium extraction is a, a new technology that uh, will sort of revolutionize lithium extraction. Uh, there's a lot going on in, in the copper space to try and crack the, the leaching of primary sulfides. These two things in their respective sectors can really sort of unlock a huge amount of potential. Um, are, are there any other sort of technologies that you can see on the horizon that you think will make big change? Yeah, I'm hearing a lot about um, companies who are using hydrometallurgical processes together with things like nano filters, et cetera. A lot of this is coming from the recycling industry as we're, it's very hard to recycle a battery. And as the technology to recycle batteries is occurring, um, we're finding more efficient ways to process metal out of ore. So I think you'll actually see the huge sums being spent on recycling could come back to really help the primary mining industry. So be aware of that space. It's, it's something really interesting, very high yield, very low electricity usage. I'm really interested uh, uh, avenues there. Okay, um, another aspect that is, is gonna play on this is with the scarcity of metals, 
you know, the pricing is going to go up, you know, basic supply and demand here. Um, as prices go up, that uh, all magically turns waste into ores. Have you, has McKinsey sort of, you looked into that and, you know, if copper does go up from, let's say, $4 a pound to five or six or even seven, you know, how much new material will suddenly magically become ore? Oh, prices always help, right? Um, and one of the things we talked about in our talk was prices can't be, uh, I'm an OEM. I'm going to try to provide the best battery at the best cost and the best performance. If prices get too high in one commodity, I do have options to move to others. And so I think that's something really important to understand. So when prices go up some, it completely opens up new avenues for new materials, for new recycled materials, for all the stuff to come through. Um, but on the other hand, if prices get too far away from sort of um, what substitution could come in, you will see that. So. So that sort of gets back to your point about long term and where to make investments. Make investments so that the material's there, so that you can make a good profit margin, but you don't want to see things too far out of hand. Okay. Now, with so many changes going on, the uh, the traditional concept of a mining company, I think, is rapidly revolving. We're seeing that in exploration, we're talking about in processing and the actual extraction in the first place. Um, is the sort of traditional mining company obsolete? Is it having to sort of change into a technology company, an IP company, or, or something completely different? You hear more and more, particularly among the major companies, that they are material providers. So why? Um, Say I'm in the US and I have the IRA. I need to have a certain content, 51% localized. That 51% localized content could come from a local mine, but it also could come from recycled material. So what if I'm providing material that's a combination of virgin material and recycled material uh, to help that OEM meet the sort of guidelines they need to get government assistance to produce cells localized. So I think from that standpoint, it does change things because they're needing to use their expertise in sort of a bunch of different avenues. So I think from that standpoint, yes, the industry is changing. Okay, Ken, uh, I'd like to ask with a forward-looking statement, uh, what do you think will be perhaps the most significant advance in this whole space this year? This year, um, <coughs> I don't know if we'll see anything massive. We do see the uh, evolution of non-nickel batteries. So you have seen LFP batteries, iron phosphate, really come to fore, particularly in China. There have been a number of commercial announcements in China about LMFP, which is adding manganese. Note that no battery manganese is processed outside of China today. So there are a bunch of pilots. We hope they're successful. But manganese will be sort of one of the materials to help us stretch our nickel out. And I think that's something we'll see more and more occur. Again, to try to, how do we get from one terawatt to 400? So much metal, there's gonna need a lot of different ways to get us there. Manganese is one. Okay, well, this is a fascinating conversation and it's a fundamental conversation. So I'm really pleased you were able to join us today, Ken. We'll certainly be uh, following this up in the future. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Paul Harris. Stay tuned to Kitco for more from PDAC 2023. Kitco Mining special coverage of PDAC is brought to you by Gold Mining and Uranium Energy Corps.